So thank you all for accepting this this um, podcast interview. So I would like to start with a, a little background of how of your job, and then we can go to the new stuff that you are doing right now. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, my title, I guess, start off with the official stuff as I'm president of a company called Ducimus Capital Incorporated. And Ducimus is simply a Latin word that stands for we lead. It's also one of the models of uh, one of the military branches of the Canadian Armed Forces, which is suiting since, suitable since we're at Remembrance Day. But uh, and Ducimus Capital is a private capital company. So the, the, the best way to describe that is uh, for commercial businesses and agricultural businesses, there are times during their life cycle when they don't qualify for reasons usually outside of their control, but they don't qualify for what we would call standard financing, bank financing, credit union financing. So in those particular instances, the private capital market steps in. And if the risk is acceptable and we see and now in Ducimus's case, we we step in only when we see that the client can get back to banking standards because private capital, as wouldn't be a surprise to anyone, costs more than than a bank's loan capital costs. So um, our clients, uh, if we see that we can help them get through their temporary uh, tough look, tough spot they're in and get back to banking criteria, then uh, we will step in and we will advance the funds they need to get them through to that period. So that's what the company does. That's what we do. Uh, my background is 40 some years in banking, uh, both mainstream, big five banks, credit unions, and now I'm in the private capital sector. So I've spent pretty much my career, I, I started as uh, what was called way back in the day, a teller oh. <laughs> at a bank, <laughs> yeah. now, now called a, a, a CSR, a customer service representative. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I was, a, I was a teller. That's how I started my career at a high school. So you have a lot of years in banking. Do you see right now the, uh, a transition that maybe banks disappear? Or what is what you see? Because you've been there. So it's for us down out of that, we maybe miss something. Yeah. The, <laughs> I think, and, and again, um, it's hard to predict the time this will take because uh, the time both to deliver <laughs> vaccines or to change a business model uh, is getting shorter and shorter year after year as, as we go on. So when I say over time, I have a hard time if that, if predicting if that's five years or 10 years or 15. Well, I don't think it's 15, <laughs> everything speeds up. But you aren't going to see uh, bank branches. This is in my view, remember? Mm -hmm. I don't speak on behalf of them now. I don't work there. I did work for 28 years in the system. But having watched it for 40 years, I think everything is moving to an online uh, service provider. You're, you're seeing even money starting to disappear as Bitcoin and things like that are, mm -hmm. are showing up. So you're going to see less and less cash transactions, less and less in-person transactions. And the banks will be driving down what they call their bricks and mortar locations. Um, and so banking is going to be a, a lot different in the future is my belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and my, even myself. So I've been in um, online banking, like simply, you don't see branches. So, and I remember yes. in that time when these guys start, it was like, a, do you really, uh, are you not scared that I'm going to steal something? I said, no, because you save a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. And, and frankly, I think they build into their business model. If you, if you start to go purely electronic and uh, purely not seeing the client in person and, and knowing the person because they come into your branch every third day due to their banking. So everybody knows the person. But as you get more remote and get more distant, you're right. They'll drive down their cost structure so much that the savings outweighs the additional losses they take. 
they will add to every business. If you're a grocery store, you end up with losses. The lettuce spoils. You got to throw it out. You just got to sell more lettuce than what's spoiled to make it profitable. It'll be the same on um, doing electronic banking and the risks of that the losses versus the savings and uh, they'll solve it. I mean, every time they figure out a way that somebody can't um, hoop them to use the expression <laughs> uh, or, or defraud them, uh, they'll figure out a way to block it. And then the fraudsters will figure out a way to get around it. And mm. They'll figure out a way to block it and on it'll go to the show. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though right now the banks are, I'm, I think at the beginning they were, a little skeptical about the Bitcoin and all those uh, different yeah. kind of money and transaction. They, they, right, right now they are jumping into the game because I think they were like, a, okay, I better put my, put yes. me, be smart because this is not going anywhere. So no, the um, it's interesting. Uh, I fi I find um, watching whether it, it, it really doesn't matter whether it's financial services or what it is, but this this, mo this is what a, a model I've sort of observed over a long period of time. So the uh, dot-com industry came along and everybody gets excited and smart money starts chasing dot-com. That's followed by a bigger crowd of silly money starts chasing dot-com and it goes up and it falls over the cliff and some people make money and some people lose money, but dot-com's still around. Mm -hmm. It's just in the initial launching it goes crazy and people get a little over the top with their enthusiasm. And you could follow that through the cannabis industry or anything that is new Bitcoin that comes out. You get the initial smart money that goes in, followed by the crowd. You know, oh my God, they made money at that. I should get on board too. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then too much of the crowd gets on board and it drives the price way too high. And then it, the market adjusts. And it, a new normal is reached. So it's um, there's an old business expression: is you don't have to be the one that invents the solution, but if you're going to be really good, you've got to see where the world is going and then get there early. Mm -hmm. And one of my customers one time, way back in banking, so without naming, but this person had a good, steady job, a decent job, but they'd accumulated far more money than you would think somebody with that earnings would and so i asked him i said how long have you done so well over the 30 years you've been working and he said my grandfather gave me three sets to, two sets of advice one invest in alcohol and tobacco people are going to smoke and people are going to drink and two he said the most important one when everybody else is buying you sell when everybody else is selling you buy <laughs> so, <laughs> and he said i've just followed that advice uh in my career you know so he's he, he, and he had done very well for himself yeah, yeah. We, we we have the the big uh example like 2020 and this this is the mm -hmm. year where alcohol was like a yeah. in the roof. <laughs> it was the thing that kept you sane at home <laughs> yeah like yeah the yeah, it's um, it, it it is interesting to watch things, but uh, and and how people's perspectives are different. I had mm -hmm. I had uh, I had been at a conference just recently, and I was listening to a pharmacist present about cannabis, and he's the head of a, of a cannabis company, and he was extolling its virtues. And I'm not against it, so this is not a for or against. This is about observation. Observation. So yeah. he was he was extolling the virtues of how it helps you sleep, how it helps you be calm, and how he has a bong by his bedside. <laughs> and, and sometimes when he's a little stressed at two in the morning, if he wakes up, he'll take a couple of puffs and relax, go back to sleep. And I was translating that to my age. And I was thinking, if I sat in a group at a conference and I said, I keep a bottle of vodka by my nightside table. And when I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, I just take a couple of belts <laughs> and I go back to sleep. <laughs> I think people would have looked at me and said, he has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> whereas, whereas with cannabis, it's like, oh, no, he just got up and he you know, had, had a drink of warm milk and went back to bed. <laughs> and, and, uh -huh. and remember, uh, in, in our times, like, uh, oh, my God, um, 
pot. It was like a wow, like a no in the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's like a wow. So, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. It's just, it's it's just different perceptions. But uh, the um, anyway, I can. Uh, so that's sort of my background. What I do. I if someone said to me, or once I was asked, what was my uh, expertise or my uh, and then my key to success, and I guess my expertise is lending. My technical, a mm. bricklayer knows how to lend bricks or or how to build a house with bricks. I know how to assess risk and lend. That's my technical expertise. But my what's probably stayed me through my career and helped me advance is leadership. Just just really uh, being being in love with what it takes to lead and create things mm -hmm. and build something from nothing to something. You know, and and the fun that comes with that. So that's. Um, that's what I've kind of really, when I reflect back, and I'm not retired yet. Uh, I don't know if I ever will retire. But uh, when I look back at the various places I've worked and the things I've done, and, and the fact that I relocated our house 24 times in my career across North America to go where the work is, that what really stayed me through all of this and helped me along wasn't the technical skills that was a given to, to be at the table you had to have the technical skills it was the leadership skill that keeps you at the table mm -hmm. that's my my thinking on it but doesn't mean i'm right <laughs> so when when a business like a startup is gonna is thinking to launch something in always obviously i don't know why everybody is focusing i don't have the money i don't have the money but what is your advice like for those entrepreneurs that they start and they feel like if I don't have the money, I'm not going to be able to, to keep going. Yeah. The, um, okay. I, and I'll, I'll be careful of my communication styles. I tend to wander sometimes. <laughs> so pardon me if my, if I wander. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, the, there's a saying in credit, which is a, uh, kind of or investors mm -hmm. uh, and it's, they, they laugh the, the investors laugh when they say this it, it's standard with with my idea and your money we're going to make the tons <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and of course the investor goes uh, and as lenders used to say if you want to borrow 100 percent to buy the cattle farm don't come to me because if i wanted to own a cattle farm i'd go buy one mm -hmm. i'm i'm here to help you get the cattle farm mm -hmm. so so anybody with a really good idea that they believe in and they have a passion for, before the, the first thing they have to do, if they don't have the cash, and, and lots of good ideas get launched when people don't have cash, but the first thing you have to look for is to find someone who believes in your idea and you so much so um, that they will invest. But they will, they will say, listen, I know uh, most uh, private capital because anybody who's trying to start something up generally doesn't have the collateral to go to a bank. So they're going to have to go to private capital. Private capital wants to be the second money in. They want to see somebody who believes in it so much that they put some of their own capital risk. So an entrepreneur who's got a really good idea that they really believe in, their first search has to be, uh, for someone else who believes in it so much that in exchange for partial ownership, because it almost involves partial ownership, not too often you'll find somebody who says, oh, yeah, I'm just going to dump the cash in and you pay me back when you can. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. just, it, just, it doesn't happen that way or, or usually doesn't. So that's their first search is they have to find someone who believes in their idea to the point that they are willing to risk some of their cash. Those those people, whether well, they actually refer to it quite often as the three F's, mm -hmm. F, F is in Frank, friends, family, and foolhardies, who take that initial step and are willing to put some money money in. Now that sounds so negative uh, when you say foolhardies and stuff, but there are firms out there that recognize we'll take if we believe in the investment, 
we'll put in some seed capital and for every 10 we invest, six will be a write-off, we'll lose it. Two will break even on and two will be home runs. And those home runs pay for all the losses mm. and everything. But you have to knock on an awful lot of doors. Like you, um, if you don't have persevere, if you don't have two things, this is my view about being an entrepreneur. Set aside the whole idea, set aside your concept. But if you're not tenacious one and adaptable, prepared to change course and, and do what it takes as you learn new things, because not everybody knows everything. Somebody may come up and say, I think you've missed something in your idea. What about this weakness? And if you are just, that's it, my idea is right, you're wrong, mm -hmm. so that you're not adaptable. So if you're not one tenacious to accept a lot of no's and uh, three adaptable or two adaptable, then you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Um, I'll compare it over to the, to the writing game. And I think it was Stephen King who said, before he ever got his first short story published, he got told no over a hundred times. Abandon this, you don't have any talent. So the tenacity to be told go away over a hundred times before yeah. somebody says, hey, listen, I think you got a bit of a thing here. Let's take a look. Um, that's, that's tenacity. And so if you don't have it, you shouldn't start. You know, I just yeah. kind of kind of harsh but that's what i believe mm -hmm. and um right now what are you doing like i i'm the filming area how you jump <laughs> the transition <laughs> the transition banking filming that is probably an entirely separate podcast and i'm i'm not casting a net to be invited for a second one but it's a larger story but i'll, I'll give you the very short part of it okay i was in california for a five-year assignment and had a house up here in Canada and I was knew I was going to be in California and half the year my wife would be down there with me and half the year she wouldn't and being a frank speaking male I went hmm okay I'm by myself for six months a year in California I could go to the bars which will ultimately lead to paying alimony because <laughs> it, it just won't go well uh, or I could watch tv and become 500 pounds yeah. Or what am I going to do? And I thought, I've always wanted to see if I could write a book. It turned out, now, I have never in my career ever done anything I didn't love. If I don't like doing something, I don't do it. Mm. So you got you to enjoy your work. Yeah. I, thought I, I thought I loved, and I do love, banking and finance. I'm not an accountant, but I love the, the work. After I was finished the first book, I discovered, holy catfish, I don't just love this. I was just excited to get at it again. So one novel became two, two became three, three became four. I now have seven completed. And I am not, so I, another key to business, another key to business, whether it's okay. writing or anything else, another key to business is uh, Clint Eastwood's line. A man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I am not Margaret Atwood. I do not write what they call in Canada literary fiction or highbrow fiction. The life of pie, looking for meaning within the meaning. I'm a thriller commercial fiction. Somebody could die. Somebody could live a desperate adventure. That's my stuff. So I knew I wasn't a literary writer. The second thing is I knew I wasn't a... Um, not very good at English literature. I spell awfully. Punctuation is not my thing. Syncopation or whatever those words be, I have no clue. I can tell a really good story. I, I, I came to believe in myself, but I knew I would need an editor. So the third thing I realized was I don't read books myself. The last book I ever read was Catcher in the Ryan grade 10. Don't read books, love movies. So every book unfolded in my head like movie that then after I got done the seven I started thinking about I've got to get introduced to people who do movies I know nothing about that industry absolutely nothing other than I know if I go pay my $19 I go and watch a movie and I know what I hate I, I, I hate the policeman who looks in his revolver 
sees he has three shots left. He's chasing five guys with machine guns. He shoots one of them who falls down in front of him. But instead of bending over to pick up the machine gun, he keeps chasing the other four with his three remaining bullets. Like, that wouldn't happen. Why would you film that? So, like, I go, I try to write realistically. I try to write from what I believe would really happen in a real situation. And when I was done, I started knocking on doors. And back to Stephen King. They said, you've got to have a really thick skin. If you're going to try to get into this business, you've got to have people look at you and say, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you've got to have the intellect to, to figure out, do you really suck? Because sometimes you do. <laughs> or is that just that person's opinion? But there are ears of market. Mm -hmm. And I just kept knocking on doors to finally some answered. And now I'm at a stage where literally Chuck Russell has read two of my books. Chuck Russell is the director for Collateral with Stephen King or not it's collateral with tom cruise he directed uh, the rock in a movie he wow. did friday the 13th he's done a whole bunch of very and he wants to direct he's made an offer mm -hmm. doesn't mean it'll happen because in this business it's like the entrepreneurial business so the director says i'm in go find the money to make the film because i'm not the money guy i just i'm the director <laughs> so then you start knocking on more doors <laughs> okay so but at least at least maybe the I mean, money is not a big problem because you already know where where to get it so maybe. yeah well yeah it could it could be I, <laughs> I i i don't know I'm, I'm having fun at it i'm not silly enough to give up my day job <laughs> of course that, not <laughs> that, that's that's the one where the never give up your day job until you have something else going and um but back to the back to the key you've got to have the passion and the focus and the belief whether it's advancing your career as an entrepreneur or advancing your career in banking no matter what it is you have got to be focused adaptable aggressive mm. all, all those things and and open to criticism you've mm -hmm. got to be able to you got to be able to not take criticism as something personal. that's personal yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's kind of hard it's kind of hard not take it personal sometimes oh, i i read uh, not a reader like i said but uh, one of my relatives got me a uh, a cd book from stephen king on writing and it's about writing made by stephen king he was saying in this world of writing there's nobody cruel more cruel to other writers to, to a writer than other writers. And then he names three very famous writers. And he says, the three of them were on a panel. And one of them said this, and the other two nodded in agreement. No tree should have ever given its life for the crap that Stephen King writes. <laughs> <laughs> like, out, out. <laughs> wow. So you just have to. Enjoy have to have, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And enjoy the ride and if you're not liking what you're doing change it yes yeah, yeah. and i think patient is 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 a virtue that uh this 2020 uh, kind of put it us like a, uh, are you really p patient are you how you're gonna be handled this so i think if we don't get it it's like a, okay how many how many this kind of stuff we need so i think yeah yeah and it's um sadly uh sadly it's not it's probably here to stay these type of events yeah. and i don't mean i don't mean month after month but i think the recurring cycle like um like a like, flu like, like weather they like like flu or like oh, you uh -huh. get years with droughts and then you get years with surplus rainfall but you always know you're going to get them they're just is it this year or the next year mm -hmm. i think you know, my my personal belief is it's because we're overpopulated. There's just there's so many people. It's like a, a breeding pot. Mm -hmm. And anyway, that's yeah, uh, it is. Uh, it is unfortunate that um, people can whip up sides and they get into passionate arguments. I can't remember uh, again, not, be, not being a reader. I can't remember <laughs> which Roman emperor. It wasn't said it, 
but he said the, the thing about the mob is that they're easy to create and they're easy to whip up into a frenzy. And, and that was like a couple thousand years ago. And here we are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whipping everybody up into a frenzy um, and everybody's choosing sides and, and nobody listens and everybody just yells at everybody. You know, I, I don't get it. I just, it's uh, not, uh, it, I don't think it bodes very well. Uh, we need to evolve past that. Mm. Yeah. What is the virtue that uh, you most value in a, in a, in a, in other people? Well, I, I guess, I, and I want to be, because this is going to sound a little trite or a little, oh yeah, that's corny. Honesty and integrity. I'm not talking about stealing here. Um, if I have, a, if I have a team, I, I, I operate this way myself. And I've gotten myself in some trouble once in a while operating this way, <laughs> but I still stick by it because I really want it with anybody who's in my circle. And so you imagine a meeting of 12 people. And of course, anytime you got a meeting of 12 people in a company, there's going to be the boss or the senior person. And I'm not saying that has to be me. I can be one of the subordinates. But when I talk about honesty, it's about when somebody's proposing an idea, what I see most times in a room of a dozen people is there'll be eight really quiet ones studying the boss very, very carefully. And if they see a nod from her or him that they like in this idea, wow, all of their comments come out supporting that idea because you want to be part of the team. The, to me, the most valuable commodity is speaking your mind. It doesn't mean you have to be the first person in the room to speak up. Matter of fact, sometimes you should be, sometimes you should be the last. You should moderate yourself to see what you do. But tell the truth. Eve, don't be one of the people that just reads the room and tries to determine where the boss is going so that you can support that, regardless of how you think, because that's the key to promotion. And no, that's, I think, what's the big, there's a big fancy word called sycophant. Yeah, that's just being, that's a sycophant. And I, they give me a rash. They just give me, I just, I, I, I get the hives if I'm around them because I'm not paying you to tell me what you think I want you to say. I'm paying you to come to the table with all your different experiences and go, I think this is risky and here's why. Or I think there's something we haven't thought about over here. And I, as the ultimate decider, if there is an ultimate decider, and there usually has to be in business, I may elect to say, I heard you but I'm still going to do it. But boy, the respect you earn by me knowing that half the room didn't have the courage to say anything other than yes, sir. No, sir. When can we do it, sir? Sounds great, sir. <laughs> is, is you spoke up and I got your honest opinion. That's to me the, the key. That's how when, when I'm a high school grad, that's it. I'm probably one of the last of a tranche of people who, who went from high school to a presidency. And in my career, I probably had a couple of hundred MBAs work for me. Maybe 30 of them survived. And I don't mean I fired 170 people. I mean, overall, not just working mm -hmm. for me, maybe I let them go or somebody else let them go. But very few of them, very few people in the room have the ability to just speak up and say, Here's what I think, because it's what I think. It's what I've seen. I saw something like that over here two years ago. Here's what went really well. Here's what didn't go so well. So I, I think at the executive table, when you're trying to bring somebody forward, you look for honesty, you look for integrity, and then only one other thing. Uh, and I'll just use banking as an example. Banking is very diverse. Yes, we have branches, we take deposits, we make loans, but we have a premises department, huge premises department. We have architects in there. We have, we have human resources experts. We have systems, IT experts, all kinds. It's like a little world into its own of all kinds of experts. When I'm bringing somebody to the executive table, I look for somebody that didn't stick in one thread. So human resources might be their technical skill. 
But did they take themselves out of their comfort zone and go over and learn marketing? Did they, you're not going to work in every department of a large conglomerate or a large company that has multiple departments. But the more of those departments, hands-on experience you can bring to the table versus working your way bit by bit by bit by bit to senior vice president of human resources doesn't mean you can't do that. But when I really look around the table and I start to value people's opinions on what they think a risk of a certain situation is, unless it's particularly human resources risk, then I kind of discount what you say. Well, yeah, you see that risk from a human resources perspective, mm -hmm. but, but you don't see it from the broader business perspective. So that's what I would encourage um, is people to not be sycophants, to speak your mind, give your honest opinion, and guide your career to work at as many different departments or disciplines within your company as you can, because that just adds so much value to your career. Have you ever That's, been in, in Mexico in your career at banking? Uh, no, I have been there. I've been there on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. But, no, my banking career had me in uh, all over Canada, I guess eight of the uh, 10 provinces in Canada. And uh, it had me in Illinois and in California. So I spent six years in the United States. Um, but otherwise, uh, just mostly all over Canada. Nice. It's, it's nice because, like you said, I bet you every time that you went to another city, you gain more knowledge in, in, in the way that society yeah. live and everything. Uh, and then, yes. And then you can step up with a while um uh, like um how you say it like you have more perspective of everything yes i yeah that's a very good point i i guess i probably even though i physically moved my house 24 times i moved career positions 30 or 32 times um and so that's 30 or 32 times i was the new kid in the room that i walked into an environment where Everybody else knew each other. Mm -hmm. They'd all worked together for years. And who was this stranger? Who was the interloper coming in mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from, the, from the outside? So um, fortunately, I got, a, I got a mouth that never shuts up. <laughs> so I, 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 people get to know me fairly quickly. I'm not shy. I, I don't hang out in the corner or, or, or just uh, being the new kid on the block 30 times would would destroy you. It'd be <laughs> hiding. You'd be hiding away in the corner. But uh, but you're right. Um, and things are really different, especially when I went over to the United States. Their view on business is so different than the Canadian view on on business that it was a real learning opportunity. You think they are more adventure, more like a, just do it. <laughs> Let yes, yeah, more just do it, less process. And couple that, and, and your American viewers are just probably going to go over the top angry at me. <laughs> huge distrustful, huge distrustful. I, I, after six years down there, I said to one of my American friends, I said, I finally, I think I pegged your society. It's built on distrust. No wonder there's that saying of uh, nobody ever went broke underestimating the stupidity of the American public. Or there's a sucker born every minute and two to take them. Those are all American sayings. <laughs> so, and, and, it's, and I can understand why they carry so many guns. And I'm not even anti-gun. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I kind of anti, I'm anti somebody driving a car with no license and no experience. And I'm anti somebody owning a gun with no training and no experience. You know, like, mm -hmm. so same thing. But, but their society in business seems to be, if I can sell you something that's really only worth a dollar, But in my read of you, I can sell it to you for 30. I should. And if I don't, I'm stupid. I'm just stupid for not taking advantage of that situation. It's got nothing to do with me treating you fairly. Mm -hmm. it's, what, it's what was the opportunity in front of me. And now, and since I know if you can sell me something that's worth a dollar for $30, that you would screw me over that way, pardon my French, <laughs> is then I got to be wary of you and distrust you because you would take advantage of me. And their whole society. So I, I, I take that right down to the street level. If I can mug you and get away with it, then I should. 
I'm stupid not to, because you shouldn't have been walking there by yourself. You mm-hmm. set yourself up. Well, and since you would mug me, then I better carry a gun. <laughs> so, oh, just, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's the saying. The, the whole yeah. rate from business rate down to the smallest level is, is that whatever I can get away with is absolutely fine. Yeah. And uh, I think, was there a tweeter and the monkey man or, or a song by uh, a very famous song, but it goes, uh, in Jersey, everything's legal as long as you don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's what i see the difference between canada and now on the other hand in canada we legislate things so much yeah. and we check so much so that nobody wants to take advantage of somebody else which still happens but that trying to launch a new idea is just so hard because there's so much process and so much protection you know it, it's uh it's, it's like me saying i am an author in canada but i do commercial fiction Ew, ew, commercial fiction. You mean that beach stuff? Uh, <laughs> we write we write quality literary fiction up here. <laughs> you think it's gonna be changing the culture in in Canada because it's a lot of immigrant. I'm I'm not against an immigrant, I am one, yeah. but uh, I think I'm gonna say it anyway. Like you 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 motivate me to speak out. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they don't put a lot of effort in what people bring into Canada. And, and I feel like a, I've been here 20 years, so I've been yeah. seeing a transition. So yeah. I feel that some people, they carry the same um, culture and sometimes that culture is not a, a good one. Or, or yes. And they kind of start making and instead of blend in a new culture, they want to keep it the same. So I, yeah. think, I think they are kind of. Yeah, it, it's uh, that's um, that is a very interesting topic, and it's one I've had many a a, a, a glass of wine filled discussion <laughs> <laughs> with people over, and and I'm kind of st- stuck in the middle. And, and I know this is going to sound a little trite, a little maybe corny that I say this, but I always look at every problem or a problem statement from the two extremes. What's the worst? What's the best? What then in the middle is what's more likely, you know? So at the worst case, yeah, you, you do have immigrants come in and they will generally settle where there's more. Yeah, I think. Sorry, somebody on. dialed. Somebody dialed in on me. I, I, I don't. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, they will generally uh, settle where there's more of that speak their language. Where it's a comfort zone. We all try to stay in our comfort zone, and yes, they will bring uh, their religion and 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 things like that. Um, so, on the one hand, one could say, you know, I think Australia takes a pretty big stance. If you're coming to Australia, adopt Australian ways. But then on the other side, I, I tend to challenge people who, who push hard on that and say, but if we did all that, you wouldn't have any Chinese food restaurants because they would have just cooked Canadian. Mm-hmm. They would have adapted. You wouldn't have any Italian. You wouldn't have any Portuguese. So you can't pick and choose. Well, you can bring that part of your culture with you, but you can't bring that other part because I don't like it. And generally, I don't like it means I don't understand it. We're all, we're all the same. We, we fear something we don't understand. Mm-hmm. and i'm not trying to be silly where there isn't such thing as a bad thing i think people who do extreme diets don't help themselves people who do extreme eating <laughs> don't help themselves and so it's the same as if you have a religion that has some ex- an extremist element that's not good um but it doesn't mean um i don't know i don't know how else to describe it other than i said one time if I could made you wave a magic wand, every culture that was in the world would all have sex with each other. They'd all have babies. And then they, because you had a baby with an Italian, then you'd have to have another baby, some the next one with an Irishman. And you'd have, and pretty soon we're all the same. And there's one less thing for us to hate. <laughs> because, <laughs> because everybody looks the same. <laughs> so, but I know that's not going to happen. So um, I, I just think that we have to be um, a little more open to common sense we're okay we're that's, we're, we're, we're okay and bringing it. in the food we're okay and bringing in even the dancing traditions and going to 
uh, Lithuanian dance displays or something. But to say that you then can't wear your religious symbol or something like that, I, I kind of go, well, you can't just pick and choose. You know, we only import right-handed people into our country. If you're left-handed, you're not allowed. I, I don't know. You know, I, I just, I think there has to be more common sense applied. And if there's something you fear, learn about it. You'll probably fear it less. Good, good point, mm -hmm. really. Something else, Al, that you want to add? No, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. I would, uh, at any point in time, uh, if you uh, want to delve deeper into the whole adventure of uh, becoming a novelist and then maybe movies, because I have some meetings coming up shortly. With some, yeah, I, this is a eight year project that I've worked. I took me wow. eight years to write all these books because I still had my day job. But uh, you never know who within your audience might be interested in learning this adventure. And, uh, and, and it's not done yet. So I don't know what the outcome will be. I don't know if uh, five years from now, I'll have three movies out there that did wow. well or, or a streaming television series, or I'll still be knocking on doors. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, my, my, my son is, he's always since ever dreaming yeah. to, to, to be a, to film. And yes. Right now he has like marketing agency. So yeah, it's yeah, still, no, the, it's still his creative job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but the I dream was, uh, is to film something. Yeah. I was fortunate. My job has me flying and I meet some people and things like that. And I ended up also being introduced to, and this won't mean anything to you, but it might to your son. Mark Montgomery. Well, Mark Montgomery out of Australia was the executive producer of, of, uh, oh, sorry, another person doubting me, of Hotel Mumbai, mm -hmm. and also The Man Who Knew Infinity. And uh, so I was fortunate. He read three of my books, and he wants to be the executive producer. So wow. you never know who you can introduce people to. You just, I, I need and, to find out your books and start reading it. Yeah, well, they're, they're not for sale anywhere. I've just written them. I can send you some. You, just, oh. you, connect, you send me your email. I'd be glad to send you a Perfect. digital version. Uh, thank you, Marshall. Yeah. Okay. So like you said, maybe next time we just speak about filming and all the the – the journey that you are been doing and we'll see maybe i am in your first red carpet <laughs> <laughs> there you go and <laughs> you never know yeah well thank you very much thank for your you time. so much Al, and enjoy your visit with your uh, daughter